should jump in if we're ready. Yeah, yeah, I think we're ready. So um, you can go ahead and introduce cool. yourself. Yeah, I'll give a little bit of background about me and then and then I'll, I'll get right into it. So uh, I, I'm a tech guy. Uh, I'm somebody that's been uh, working on the internet and, and building um, the startup tech companies for like 25 years, uh, back when the internet was young. Um, and I came up uh, amongst a lot of the folks that built the first kinds of social media. So whether it is Twitter or Instagram or any of the sort of social networks, you know, YouTube, I know all those folks from when they first started building those social networks. That's the world I come from. But for me, I was always somebody that loved music, especially Prince, like he's the heart and the center of what I love about music. And so I had kind of one foot in both those worlds. My, my background was very strange. Like everybody else you talk to, musicians, artists, creatives, um, none of that. You don't want to hear me sing. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, oh, that's, that's not my lane. Um, but I'm the, C, I'm the CEO of a tech company. I'm somebody that's helped people make apps, make software. And that is a way of being creative. That is a way of expressing itself. And it is something that has that same power to move people uh, just that like music does, like film does, like photo does, like anything else. And so um, I always sort of had, like I said, one foot in both of those worlds. And, um, and interestingly to me, the big surprise, one of the great surprises of my life was about that time that I started working in, in tech, um, you know, back in the 90s and the old days. Um, that was when Prince really got into it too. He was uh, and one of the things you'll see in everything I talk about, he was a huge internet geek. He was a huge nerd about technology. And you think about, he was like the coolest dude you ever met and incredibly, you know, one of the great, most gifted musicians. And, and what his public persona never said, what people never knew on the outside was, this was a guy that knew technology top to bottom, knew how to use it, knew how to make use of it, knew what the power of it was. And uh, most amazingly, at a moment before others did. So I'm going to jump into it and talk to you about that story. Um, and you'll forgive me. I'm going to be talking about old stuff. So you're going to be like, I never heard of this tech. This is old stuff. It's all cool. I'll, I'll, I'll be able to translate the stuff you all know. But if you think about, you know, the world we all live in today where you're watching TikToks that people are doing dances on and you're, you know, watching YouTube clips of that stuff, the Prince saw all of that coming. And you think about the implications of that, of what it means to have that power to be able to see the future, not just artistically, creatively, but technologically, a lot of power to have in your hands. So I'm going to talk about how he saw that and what he did with uh, that power. Um, so we'll see. I'll ask actually, um, I think Heidi, if you're hosting, I can uh, share my screen. Um, I don't know if you can permit me to do that and I'll share my slides on this side. There we go. Thank you. All right. So can you all see that? Oh, you don't have to look at my face all the time. Um, that <laughs> talking about old wash technology, that is a floppy disk. That's at the top of that's how people used to store files back in like the 1980s or the 90s or whatever. Um, they didn't have, uh, uh, you know, just like a, a Gmail account and send files to each other. They would store stuff on a floppy disk. I'll talk about why that's there in a little bit. But the high level here is that Prince is known as a, somebody that made popular music, but he reinvented pop music using technology not just from the artistic side, from the business side. We'll talk about how. So um, the two things you're going to hear me just talk about this whole time, two things over and over and over are ownership and control. Separate from how he mastered his instruments, what Prince was about as a businessman, and he was a very successful businessman, was ownership and control of his work. He wanted to control how it got to people. And what was really important to him was ownership because so many musicians, especially black musicians over the years, have been exploited to where they didn't get to control their work. Other people made the money off of it. And Prince wanted to make sure that that wasn't the case in the long term for his work. Uh, and so technology is one of the main ways that he made that happen. Um, so let me get into first the music side. Um, you've all been you know, blessed enough to get to talk to some these incredibly talented musicians and artists. I want to take you way, way back. And this is even before my time, so don't, don't feel bad if, if this is something you've never seen. How many of you all have ever seen a box like this or know what this is? Nate, I see your hand. You can unmute. What is it? Drum machine. Drum machine. All right. Shout out. Good. So this is a drum machine. This is a Lynn drum machine. And this is the kind of the one that sort of prints a signature drum machine. This came out. Um, That's the drum machine right there. This is the drum machine. This came out in 1980. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. First of all, a drum machine, this is a computer that makes beats. It's a, it's a, it's a machine that makes beats. Until this point, before this particular model came out, this was like the, the new iPhone of its day. Before this one came out, um, we have what were called analog drum machines. And what they were is they had almost like a tape recording of a drum that would play whenever you programmed it and would hit it. 
and they were kind of janky and kind of, they didn't sound great, but you could make beats with them, but they weren't anything like what we see today. And, and in fact, the only, one of the few people that were really great at that was like Sly Stone back in the 70s, he was one of the first ones, and he had the first real uh, a pop music hit uh, We're using a drum machine called If You Want Me To Stay. But that was really it. Stevie Wonder played with him a little bit, but it wasn't a real mainstream thing. And then Prince was, like, if you think about the first person on your block that had, like, the Nintendo Switch, or the first person that had the new iPhone, Prince was that dude. So he was like, if this is the new hotness, this drum machine, I want to know about it. I want to get it. And the guy who invented this drum machine is named Roger Lynn. That's why it's called a Lynn drum, L-I-N-N. And he sent one of the very first ones to Prince. And Prince, like just about took this thing apart. What's wild about this is it's so limited. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. Like the, it had no memory, no storage, none of the stuff we talk about with like a, a machine you buy. And if you've played with, you know, GarageBand or Pro Tools, it's real easy to throw together a beat. This was hard. The wildest thing about this is on the back of this drum machine with a screwdriver, you could turn, literally turn knobs and you could tweak the sounds to sound exactly like what you wanted. And the thing that Prince did is he did that because this one was different than all the drum machines that came before. This is actually on the inside, a computer. And that means you can manipulate the sounds, you can modify the sounds, you can change the sounds. And Prince got that. And what he was doing when he was turning those knobs and changing the sounds was instead of, before that, everybody said, well, we want this drum machine to sound as much like real drums as it can. He's going the other way. He's like, I want this to sound as artificial and computery as I can because computers are brand new. This is right the first time when people had computers at home. Of any kind. There weren't any computers at home before this. And he's like, I am going to literally program this computer to make the wildest drum sounds that we could ever have. And so if you've had the chance to listen to the beginning of 1999, where it's got that beat going, uh, which was mind blowing to us, we'd never heard anything like that. Or if you listen to One Dove's Cry and the drums are sort of just doing things that people had never heard before, to the point where he didn't even have to put a bass line in the song because the drums are, being, are playing basically the bass part of the song. The reason why was he had this computer and Prince programmed this computer in a way that even the inventor of the, the computer, Roger Lynn, had not foreseen. They couldn't imagine it could be used that way to make those kinds of sounds. So that I started here because one, this is about the music and it's about technology, but two, it is also showing that he was pushing the boundaries on what technology could do. And you think about every one of you, you've got it, you know, you're on the laptop or an iPad or whatever you're on right now to connect in. You think about there's something that the creators of that machine wanted you to do. And then there's your own expression of what you think you can make that machine do. And the reason that Prince had a breakout sound that nobody had heard before, the moment when he really became a massive pop star and everybody in the world had heard of him, the fundamental, the first thing they heard, the first note they heard was him programming a computer to do something that even the inventors of that computer couldn't have imagined. So start with that. And that's the Lindrum. That is still, that's like, if you put a stethoscope up to my heart, that's what you're going to hear is a Lynn drum. That's, 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 that's where it all begins. Um, and I'll run through another example here. This is, and this is a little hard to see, but I can send the link around so you can take a look at it later. This is a drawing. And what it, what it is is a drawing when you file a patent, which is what you file with the patent office with the government in DC. This is a proof that you've invented something and that you want to own it and make sure nobody else can copy it or rip it off. And when you do file a patent, you have to draw a drawing of what it is that you've patented. And this is a patent for a synthesizer that Prince co-invented uh, in the 1990s. And it was called a Purple Axe. And it was so innovative in its shape and the way it was designed because Prince cared so much about making new instruments, literally a new instrument nobody had had before that he filed a patent for it and actually won the patent. And so um, the thing about that is like legally, it's saying that he's got unique ownership of something he's created before. That's the level of innovation that he was trying to go at in terms of using his instruments, using technology, using new inventions to go there. And again, that was something that it's so obvious. I, I mean, every song you hear now has got since then, it's got great, you know, sort of uh, backing tracks played by a synthesizer. But in the early 1980s, when he was starting to do this work, that wasn't what you heard on the radio. People were hearing, you know, pianos and strings, but not synthesizers. And so this is a really, really big change to go through. And it shows that this innovation, he continued all the way through his career. So that's on the music. We know he's a musician. Of course, musicians are going to use new technology. Um, one of the most amazing things about that is everybody else after that tried to rip off these styles. Like everything on the radio for 10 or 15 years after was people trying to get the drum sound that the Prince had, the synth sound that Prince had. And, and one of the most... Um, dramatic examples about the synthesizer impact that, that Prince had was he had put out his, um, his song 1999. And that was really the one of the first big breakthrough songs that he had. 
And it was a you know, pretty big hit, but it just, nobody ever heard this huge sound coming out of these synthesizers before. And right when that song and that album came out, one of the people that was listening to that synthesizer sound was Michael Jackson. He was working with his producer, Quincy Jones, on creating the album Thriller, which became later the best-selling album of all time. And they literally said, late in the recording of the album, we got to go back to the studio and do this again because our song Thriller does not hit as hard as Prince's 1999. So we want to know what is the drum machine he's using? What is the synthesizers he's using? And we're going to do the same thing. And they literally did. They got the exact same drum machine model that we saw. They got the same synthesizers and they made an even bigger wall of sound because they were trying to be competitive. When you have that kind of impact on the biggest artists that have ever existed, that's the power of taking genius as a musician along with brand new technology uh, and getting people to come with you. So this also led into the work of production and creating. These days you do all this in, um, you know, in GarageBand and Pro Tools and, and all the different, uh, you know, uh, apps that are out there, Ableton or Serato, whatever you're using. Um, and, you know, in Prince's day, especially when he started out, you know, he started out in high school, everything was what we call analog, it's physical machines. These are pictures of him years later at the, at the board, at the console, uh, I guess in one case resting, but you know, he would actually control the knobs and dials um, in his studio at Paisley Park, but even before that. In fact, one of his first gigs was being a technician around the studio that he worked in as a teenager. It was like a, you know, after school job so that he could get free time to use the recording studio to record. And the thing to keep in mind is that these days, you, all, you, know, you know, you can plug into your iPad or your laptop and you can record. They didn't have any of that back then. So if you wanted to record, you had to get access to a studio. So he's like, I don't care. I'll empty trash cans. I'll clean the floor. I'll do whatever it takes as long as I get to work in this studio. And the amazing thing about that is he learned to use this recording technology. And one important part that was brand new just at the moment when Prince started working in that studio was what they call automation, which is basically giving instructions to that recording equipment. So you could say, I need you to be able to start recording at this point and stop at this point with this volume and change these settings. And what that let him do was record himself playing multiple instruments. You all know he played drums and he played guitar and played keyboards. But keep in mind, you can't do all that at the same time. So unless you've got some way to control and say, I'm going to go back and record over and layer all these things, that's real, real easy to do in the computer right now. You've seen all those tracks and the recording tool you use. They didn't have any of that in the tape age. So he had to learn to do that on these boards. And so because he was able to learn that, that stayed a skill of using that technology that stayed all the way through his entire career to the point where almost every one of the songs you've heard where you've heard Prince singing was him recorded at a microphone at one of these recording boards, not in the studio. He wasn't standing in the, in the recording part where the rest of the musicians were. He would record it at the mic because he recorded it himself. He'd push record himself. And that used to be a job of an engineer or somebody else that's a tech that's in the studio, but he would do what's called punching in. Like he'd push record himself sometimes 10, 12, 14, 16 vocal tracks on one song and record it all himself. And so this was something these days you all take for granted that you've got an app that you can use to record stuff with. He was doing that before those existed because he knew the technology was headed that way. So no surprise, by the time Pro Tools came out years later or whatever recording apps he was using uh, years later, he knew how to do all of it. It was nothing to, for him to learn. He was just that far ahead. So that's on making the music. Of course you know that. Of course this is a guy that makes music and he's going to use technology to do it. What was just as important to Prince, especially in sort of the second half of his career, was about ownership and control, as I said, of the music business, of making sure he owned his work. It was really, really important to him. He would talk about his songs as his children and that he wanted to make sure they stayed free. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Um, one of the first things that blew my mind, I already knew I loved Prince's music, but what blew my mind about him as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, as an inventor, as a technologist, was that he had websites way back. So this is a website called The Dawn. Uh, this was, the, the, I think, the postcard to promote it. It came out back in 1996. For context here, this is before uh, Netflix existed. This is years before Google existed. Prince had a website. And initially he was just sort of sharing, hey, here's what's going on at that time. He actually, um, he got married that year and he had the wedding photos up and all that kind of stuff, you know, like, like things that you'd see on Instagram or whatever now, but he was doing it back then. But the wild thing about it is very quickly, he started to put up content like music and his writing and ideas and just things he would share. Things these days you'd see on a, you know, a blog or a tweet or a Facebook update or whatever. He was putting out there on his website. 
So you had this first version of the website. And keep in mind, things are very, very primitive back then. In fact, this was so long ago that when this website, the Don launched, he actually had a page to teach you how to buy things online. He's like, this is the thing people are going to do in the future. If you'd like to buy a CD, which is the way you got music back then, you can actually put a credit card in and type it in and you can buy stuff. Everybody in the world does that now, but he had to teach people that was something that would exist as you might use the internet to buy stuff. Because for context at this point, for example, you couldn't even buy CDs on amazon.com at this point. They didn't sell CDs yet. You can buy any music on amazon.com. He was doing it before Amazon was. And then he fast forward a couple of years later and he started to do something where I'm sure you, all of you have used like Spotify or, or you know, iTunes, whatever it is, Apple Music. He was doing that same thing a couple of years later. This in this case was the very first version of it called the MPG Music Club. And it was an app and it would run on your computer like Spotify does or whatever else. And you could download songs and pay him and pay for music. Now, if we all take that for granted, we listen to this stuff all the time. But keep in mind, this is before Apple invented iTunes, which later became Apple Music. This is um, the CEO of Spotify was 11 years old at the time when this came out. That's how far back <laughs> this was. And Empress was already doing it. And he was sort of inventing it. And actually, some of the guys that made the technology behind this were in another uh, electronica group that was around in the 90s called EBN. So he was working with musicians who knew the technology as well. Like he wanted to work with fellow creators. And this was mind blowing because, um, you know, he had spent so much time battling with his record company about ownership and control of his work. And that record company was one of the biggest music companies that ever existed in the history of the world. And they had nothing like this for another 10 years. That's how far ahead of time it was. Then another thing here, um, some of you might have heard of uh, something called Kickstarter or maybe Indiegogo or things like that. What people do online is they say, oh, I'm making a new record. Could you all chip in? And then as soon as I get 100 people to chip in 10 bucks, I'll, I'll put out my new record, and my new album and my new song. And you can listen to it. And that's pretty common these days. People do a lot of that. What you're seeing here is some of the artwork from an album called Crystal Ball. And Prince put this one out back in 1997. And what he did is what's called crowdfunding. It's what Kickstarter is. He said, as soon as I get 100,000 people to pre-order this online through this very simple internet web form, you can type in credit card number. As soon as I get 100,000 orders, I'll create this album. Now, these days, everybody does that. There have been crowdfunded albums from like every artist you've heard of. There's, there's probably thousands and thousands of them on uh, uh, Kickstarter right now or on Indiegogo or these other places. None of that existed back then. None of that, right? And so he's, again, at this point, and I talked to the founders of Kickstarter, the platform where people do this, and they were like, we had no idea somebody was doing this 15 years before us. We, we couldn't even have imagined somebody was doing this back in the 90s. And, and, and Prince did it. And, you know, what's interesting about it is it was such a success that he actually got physical CDs made and they were sold in stores later. It was such a hit and it was one of the sort of highest profit, best-selling records for him, even though it wasn't something that ever had a song on the radio or a video that people watch or anything like that. And so this was really about using technology to go direct to fans, but also to see how much interest they had in what he was building. And that was interesting because it also represented this two-way conversation. It wasn't just, I throw the music out there and hope you like it. It was sort of saying, well, I can prove that you like it because you've already committed to buying it. And that's really this, I think, actually a form of respect for the fans that nobody had really thought of before that moment. Um, and then you go all the way into membership. Again, a website some of you might have heard of, I think a lot of artists are really obsessed with these days, is called Patreon. And Patreon is where you can become a subscriber site. So maybe you watch a YouTube channel and you see people like, hey, subscribe to my Patreon, hit me up and give me money every month. Patreon launched about uh, six or seven years ago. And, and again, Jack, the CEO and founder of Patreon, is a musician. He would started a group called Pamplemousse, and of course, those things are there. And I talked to Jack about it. And I said, did you know Prince was doing basically Patreon? 20 years ago. And he's like, no idea, mind blown. He's like, well, I wish we could have learned from him. We could have seen, we could have copied his ideas. And in this case, this was another version of the MPG Music Club. Prince was doing membership. And these days, if you have a membership on a Patreon or something like that, they'll say, oh, if you subscribe at a certain level, you get perks. Like I'll send you a t-shirt or I'll give you benefits. And Prince did all that, he gave us t-shirts. The most mind blowing thing he did was on the music tour he did in uh, 2002, one night alone. Um, he would let us into his sound checks. So there's a, a very famous uh, opera hall here in New York City called Lincoln Center. And it's very fancy. It is, I was like, man, I don't even know if I'm dressed up enough to come in this place. So I went to the show and you know, they've got like the balcony. You can picture people watching the opera or whatever there. I was like, I don't know anything about any of that, um, you know. 
And, you know, we go in there and because we were in the fan club, you got to go to the sound check. So there's nobody in there. There's maybe a couple dozen of us, 50, 60 people, not a lot of people. And I go and, uh, and I'm walking up the aisle because we got the seats in the front. He gave us the good seats because we were members of this music hall. It was pretty amazing. And there was a guy sitting kind of in the middle, uh, five or six rows back. And, uh, and, you know, people would kind of dress up as Brent's or like wear his kind of clothes or whatever. And I, I didn't notice till the woman in front of me goes, girl, that's not him. And you turn around and you say, what? And it was Prince. He was sitting with us because we were members of this music club. So the, the perks weren't just sending you a t-shirt or something. He would chill out with fans. And this is a point when he's one of the biggest stars in the world. And if you imagine, you know, whoever you want to think of today, if you picture like Drake sitting down with like 50 fans and he's got the microphone in his hand and the band is up on stage because they're doing a sound check. And he's singing the songs and talking to us. He let one of the guys in the crowd come up and play his guitar so he could play with the band. I mean, this was another level. Nobody, still, nobody's ever done anything like this, you know? And it was, it was one of the most amazing memories of my life. And that was what he would do in every town. He did that, that was in our case in New York City. He did that in Washington, D.C. He did that in Chicago. And, you know, it's one of those things where he's still ahead of time. You cannot imagine... If Beyonce goes on tour, I don't care what level of membership you pay for. She's not going to sit there with you and chill me like you can play with my band. And, and Prince was doing that at that level. And, you know, what was wild about it was that same venue, not two years later, he's inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And it's that kind of stage. It's that kind of place. And he welcomed us in there. And then he also said, like, don't dance too hard because they usually have opera here. So they're not going to be used to people having being this funky. They're going to tear the place down. Um, but that was something that was really just amazing to see. And in addition to that, you would get new music every month and you would get podcasts every month and you would get, he would send you videos sometimes and he would send you t-shirts and that was all cool, but nothing like actually getting to sit with him and see him in his, you know, and performing in that creative space. And then the part that y'all are probably most familiar with, like social media, he was one of the pioneers and one of the innovators on this space too. But I'm going to take you way back first. So, as you may know, back in 1993, Prince changed his name to a symbol, and I, I take, people thought he was wild. They were like, what, he's lost his mind, what has he done? And he actually explained it. He explained it on that first website, The Dawn. He said, and, I'll, and I can share the letter with you all, he, he said, you know, I don't control my music, I don't control my name, I can't control whether a record is released under the name Prince, so then that's not gonna be my name. And he did a couple things right after that. The first is on the right side of your screen, there's this uh, yellow, and that's called a disk. It's a floppy disk. That's how people used to store files back in the day. And that's where you would save stuff. And what he did is uh, he made a font, and that font had his symbol that was his new name on it. And that was so people who were making magazines or newspapers or whatever could put his symbol in. And this is actually my photo of the actual disk. I got one of the actual disks. They sent this disk with the font on it out to all the big magazines and all the big websites and everywhere else so that they could put his name on their, uh, in their stories. And people were like, what it, like, we've never even heard of this. What is like, is this your logo? What is this? And it sort of broke people's brains. And they were like, I don't know, maybe he's just done. Maybe he's retired. We don't know what's going on. And so for a couple months, almost a year, we didn't hear anything from him until uh, about a year after he changed his name, this thing on the left came out. And this is called a CD-ROM. And this, the way to think of this, it's almost like, if you put a, you know, a cartridge into a Nintendo Switch or whatever, like this is what games came on back in the day. It's like a disc in a, in a PlayStation or whatever. But these are what we put in the computer. And this was the very, very early days. Nobody had ever done this before. And what it was, was a game where you could explore a virtual world. And in every room of this virtual world, there was Summer Prince's music. There was a virtual version of his studio in Paisley Park. There was songs he'd never released before. There was different videos. It was like nothing we've ever seen. Imagine making an entire video game that's just about Prince and his work, and it showed you all the songs he made and how he'd made them. I mean, it was unbelievable. And for, the wild thing about it was most people with computers at the time couldn't run it. Like, it was too advanced. It was like if you had a game for the old Xbox, but it needed the new Xbox, like, you had to upgrade in order to play this thing. And the funny thing about that is it meant that everybody who was still a Prince fan at that point all of a sudden became experts in technology. Because we had to. We had to learn how to upgrade our computers and get connected. So he trained his fans to be super online, super digital, like super up to speed. And this is before 
the internet. This is before the web, the, the, before any of these technologies existed. So the first thing he did is he just taught us to use technologies. Like, if you want to come with me, you're going to have to become experts at this stuff. And then we did, and then he took off running. So one of the ways that people connected back then, it was called America Online. And this is basically like a chat room. And, and what it meant is like, if you've been on Discord or anything like that, you could talk to people, Slack is like that. Like it's a people, you know, and even it's kind of just like a group text. If you've ever been in a group text message. But this is back in the old days. So it was like, people like, oh, that's nerd stuff. Normal people didn't talk about AOL chat rooms. Like that wasn't a thing. Uh, they didn't talk about going on here. But we were geeks because we had to be, to be Prince fans. And so we would go on once a week and just chat and talk to other Prince. Hey, what, what, what music are you listening to? What do you, what do you think is cool? And the name of the chat room was Paisley Park so people could find it because they're like, oh, that's going to be where Prince fans are going to be. And uh, they started doing it once a week on Sunday nights. And a couple months after that started, there started being these mysterious names that would pop up, like NPG 2000 and uh, a couple other names. They would be like, I wonder who that is. Long story short, come to find out, it was Prince. He was jumping into the chat rooms with us as fans. And if you imagine you're on a group text with your friends or you're in a Discord chat with your friends talking about an artist you love and they come into the chat and they're actually typing, I mean, our minds were blown. And you know, we were like, no way. This, this is bold. There's no way it's actually him. Because the other big stars at the time were like Madonna or Michael Jackson. Like, they're not going to be in the chat with us. Like right now, if you're like whoever, you know, Taylor Swift is not hopping in the chat with people. That's just not happening. It, but it was him. And, and we're like, you know, basically, prove it. How do we know it's really you, right? <laughs> like, and he would say, well, there's an award show next week, the American Music Awards. And I'm going to go on there and I'm going to play these songs and I'm going to tell them, I changed my name and I'm going to do this. And we're like, yeah, well, yeah, whatever. And then exactly the songs and exactly the order he said, he came out and did it. And we're just like, the only person who would know is him. So it must really be him. So this started happening more and more. And he would tell us about, I want you to come and line up outside of the, the tonight, sh uh, the late show, which was at that time, uh, Dave Letterman. And we go, oh, we're going to go to the late show. And then he would come and show up and play, or I'm going to do a record sign. So he started connecting with us directly. And this is at that point, uh, 12 years before Twitter existed, before any sort of modern social media. It's, it's, it's uh, almost 10 years before Facebook existed. He was doing all this work. So then we're hooked. We're like, we just got to follow him wherever he is because he's in the future. And by the time the social media networks you know came along, he was all over it. So um, this is a clip when he was on our Arsenio Hall show saying, I'm trying to get Prince to Graham. Uh, he came on Instagram real early on. He was on Twitter all the time. This is a conversation I had with him. He tweeted back and forth with me all the time. I asked him, did you ever thought, think about showing your work, your work process in the studio? And he said, no, it's too sacred. And you think about the glimpse you get to get now of talking to people who created with him. That was the most sacred moment for him. And you get to see that, you know. But he would engage in dialogue directly with fans all the time. And you know, so many other people that are big celebrities use social media to keep a distance. They're like, I'm going to throw this over to you and then I'm going to run away. You don't get to talk to me. But he really talked to people, you know, um, late in his life. One of the questions I'd asked him, he'd done a cover of a, a Bob Marley song that I loved. And I was like, oh, are you ever going to put that out? And he's like, well, I have to get permission from the family, uh, the estate of Bob Marley before I can put it out. And it was just amazing to have that kind of dialogue. And perhaps the most profound thing, and the thing I want to leave you with is, he had used this in two really, really important ways. First, by delivering his music directly to his fans and connecting with them through the earliest forms of social media all the way to the most modern. He had a relationship directly with his fans that let him own his work. It gave him leverage to where he could fight the record companies to come back and get ownership of his work because he knew he had another way to go, even if they tried to fight him. And that was incredibly powerful. But I think the most meaningful and profound thing was it became almost a collaboration with fans. So this is one of the last tweets that Prince ever sent. And a lot of people shared it or amplified it after uh, he passed away, thinking, oh, this is some, you know, almost emotional or religious statement that he was making. But he said, I am transformed because he was quoting what one of his fans had said to him about the last concert that he did. He was re responding back to them with their own words, basically saying, I feel the same way. And, you know, the thing to keep in mind is there's that artwork that you see there of, of him, uh, his avatar there. But that was his artwork for his last few albums, as well as the clothes that he wore in his last tour. 
that was created by fans online that he connected with. The last time he appeared at Praise the Park, he held up his brand new guitar. That would have been created by people who had seen online what he had been doing and shared with him, hey, we made this guitar for you and do you want it? And they sent it to him. There are so many examples from his music to his artwork uh, to some of his last public words that were all directly inspired by having a direct connection with his fans. He was that committed to using technology to actually connect with people, not just through his music, but through his actual voice and his words. And that's something that nobody else with that kind of platform or that kind of voice or that kind of influence had ever done. And so that's one of the things I just want to leave you all with is that what technology can do is give you power to be creative in the way that you are and give you ownership so that you have control over what you do and that you should understand, you know, you've probably heard Mark Zuckerberg's name. He made Facebook, you know, they got all these people that make the tech. That's not what technology is. It's not just Facebook and, and Instagram and, 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 you know, iTunes or whatever. It is actually a tool that you can use and create with. It's just like an instrument in your hands. And you can make things that express yourself just like you make music, just like you make films. Um, and one of the people that understood that most deeply was Prince. And every bit of talent and skill and genius that he had that he would put into the music, he put into technology too and helped in service of actually achieving what he wanted to do with music in the world. So I just wanted to leave you with that note because um, it's one of the things that really inspired me in my work in technology. And I hope, as you all think, tech's gonna be a part of your life for the rest of your lives. Um, think about the ways you use it and whether it's helping you to express and create in the way that you want to too. Thank you, Anil, that was fascinating. Let's clap, let's give him some love. Thanks, y'all. Wow. I, I uh, want to share something with you, Neil. Um, shortly after Prince died, we were sitting around the table and my adult son, who's a, a tech techie kid, whatever, he said, we were talking about Prince and he brought up your name and he said something like, yeah, Anil Dash said that Prince would tweet him and delete the tweets. Like he didn't mm. believe it. He didn't believe it. Yeah. And I went, he did it to me, Leo. <laughs> He's <laughs> telling the truth. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there was a lot of skepticism because it was, seems ridiculous. Like, yeah. If you said, whatever, you know, like, any name you want to point at, you know, if you're, if you're like, oh, Kanye tweeted at me, but then he deleted it. If you're like, you're, you're, you're lying, you're out of your yeah. mind. And it's like, no, this is real. And, and I think it, it was so surprising because he had, you know, Prince had cultivated this sort of this persona. Oh, he's so distant and he's so weird. But he was like a normal dude who talked to people and explained straight out what he was doing. And I think that's something that... Um, was so surprising it just seems like such a unexpected thing so yeah it's really um yeah i think it was a a, a, a great gift that he has yeah questions you guys have questions a lot of you techies there so i feel like a lot of the stuff that happened with uh prince sort of you know like pioneering use of drum machines and synthesizers I feel like there must have been, you know, older generations who are like, that's cheating. Because there are older generations oh, who totally. say, you know, rap artists now, they use oh, yeah. auto tune on the hooks. Yeah, oh yeah, my yeah. God, they're cheating. They can't. Oh sing. God, yeah, yeah, and yeah. So, so he got, yeah, he got so much grief for yeah. that. It was like, it's not real music. And, 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 and keep in mind, at the moment he's doing this, hip hop is just becoming ascended too, right? So the very early, the very early versions of that, that um, you know, drum machine technology, but sampling technology, and even just using turntables. So there was a lot of, you know, disrespect. And I think in general, you know, a lot of black music gets undermined as being as elevated as, you know, as, as, as credible. And so definitely when you use new technology, it's undermined. And, and this goes back to, you know, there's a long, long history here where um, you know, you had uh, Stevie Wonder was the first to have the clavinet keyboard that he used, like you think of superstition. But that's the, yeah. he was the first to do it. When you talk about Jimi Hendrix, he invented the guitar pedals and actually worked on building the physical hardware that got the sound of his guitars. So there's this there's decades, centuries of history of black artists creating the technology that they used to then make their music, and every time being like, you know, well Hendrix, that's noise, that's not music, right? And Stevie Wonder like was playing a fake uh, instrument, that's not real. <clears throat> Same yeah, thing. like when uh, jazz artists switched to using electric guitars. Yeah, yeah well, even that people would, Yeah, yeah, and so, so when when Prince is using that Lynn drum machine, definitely people were like, "Well, 
if he can play drums so well, why is he using this machine? It's like, because you can't get this sound. This is the sound of the future, you know? And, and, and then he would also say, one of the things he said is like, you know, back in the revolution days and Bobby's a drummer, like sometimes Bobby doesn't want to come to the studio at three in the morning, but the drum machine does. So that's what I'm going to eat. You know, like, well, I don't blame Bobby, but that's, you know, that's like a real, um, you know, there's a pragmatic part, a practical part, which is because he knows how to use the studio, because he knows how to do automated recording and can get these things going. If you're like, you got that song in your head, you know, and whatever, if, if, if you can spend one night in the studio overnight and the results you come out with is when dogs cry, then you can't question the process. But, but I think that there definitely was a disrespect at many points along the history of undermining, you know, not just Prince, but I think a lot of artists that were like, oh, is this real? Is this official? Uh, and then, you know, history shows it's inarguable, like the art is what it is. I don't know if we're out of time, but I'm happy to take any other questions we have. I have a question. So, um, I was wondering if he ever did, do you know what Cameo is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm on Cameo, and I get to do, like, fun stuff, like, there was one person who wanted me to do, like, I, I, I'm on TikTok, and there are people mm -hmm. that'll want me to do stuff that are, that I do on TikTok, but just for them personally. Did yeah. Prince ever do anything like that? Yeah, so I mean, Cameo wasn't around back then. Um, it was uh, relatively yeah. new, but 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 definitely, you know, what he would do when he was playing around on social media, we'd see because I think there was definitely a um, he liked to still maintain his public persona, so he was never mm -hmm. going to let down that like you know coolest dude in the world. But he also knew he could play. You know, he would sort of do so. He would do the like caption contests on a photo on Twitter all the time, and then people would sort of yeah. respond back. So it was definitely like that live interaction, and that even went all the way back to like those AOL days I was talking about back in the 90s. So people would say, you know, he would be like, you know, tell me your favorite lyric about whatever and people would respond. But he would always play like, oh, that's not me. That's like the NPG. Like he'd say, we are doing this. I'm like, who's we? You know, and now I've talked to the engineers who were there in the studio with him and they'd be like, look, he was him on the keyboard, you know? But, but, yeah. but there was definitely a, a little bit of a maintaining that persona. And I think one of the things to keep in mind is back in the 80s and 90s when he's coming up into being this sort of global star, we got media through like three magazines and three TV channels. You know, there's no YouTube. There's no that. So, so it was really easy to control. He literally went when at the sort of peak of his commercial career, yeah, five years, we didn't talk to the press at all. I mean, you can't even imagine that now. We imagine no presence in the world. We just like, my music speaks for me. It's like, well, it has the music's that good, but there isn't, you know, there isn't that way. So he was really very thoughtful about like, let me maintain that persona. These days, literally the only major artist you can think of who actually keeps that boundary is probably Beyonce. Everybody else is just trying to hustle and get in front of you and talk to you all the time. And I think she's like, I'm going to drop it when I drop the album and everything else you don't need to hear. That was sort of his, his mode. But I think he loved, he so loved to connect to people so much that he would let down that guard every once in a while. But, but it was never, I think, you know, Cameo or even TikTok to some degree, it's, it's very driven by you talking to the artist. You're like, hey, could you do this for me? He's like, yeah. he's never going to be like, I don't take requests. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. like, that's never, the prince was never going to be like, yeah, I, you know, but interestingly, he even talked about that. He had a song, um, uh, The Pope, and he said, every time you want it, I'll be live, bring a date, and when I, you know, bring your computer, and when it's ever press save. And what he was saying is, like, oh, he had another song, uh, Jukebox, with a heartbeat, where he's like, I'm going to play this song. But he felt very ambivalent about that. It was very clear where he didn't like to just be like, you want me to come play the greatest hits all the time. But I think he loved the sense of interactivity of, like, if you if you come here to talk, you know, to, to communi communicate with me, to connect with me, then that's real, and that's what I love the technology can do. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, Shelby, you know better than me. I'm going to defer to you, but that, that was. <laughs> oh, yeah. Am I, am I on? Hi, everybody. Yeah. Hi, Shelby. everybody. This is Shelby J and Liv Warfield. Hey, Liv. What's up, Livy Liv? <laughs> hey. <laughs> Good to see you, Mama. Good to see you, too. How's everybody? And Neil, this was perfect. I'm like listening to you and I'm loving the conversation. It's fantastic. Yes, oh, so good to tell see you. All. you. <laughs> <laughs> Any sorry, kids? What did I miss? What did I miss? Oh, oh sure. Will you start over, please, Anil? <laughs> I, I, I had the takeaways. Anybody have any more questions for Anil before he gets back to his? Busy day. Thank you so much for taking what, the time. What was the name of Prince's font? Prince's font? Um, 
You know, they gave it some, some weird, I mean, it was little, PRN was his initials. I think it was just called PRN. I, I, I actually, what I'll do is, Heidi, I'll send you around links afterwards. So there was um, that font they put out back in the day when they had his symbol for the first time. There was um, the letter he put on his website when he changed his name, where he explained it all. And it's wild because people always, it was a mystery why he changed his name. It's like, he wrote it down. He put it on his website. I don't know what y'all need to do. It's on his blog, you know, and, and they just, they couldn't take it seriously. They couldn't see that that it, 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 he was being as direct as he was, you know, um, because I think it was so far ahead. People could not conceive of, uh, they're going to talk directly, you know, artists like this is going to talk directly to their fans. So um, yeah, I'll be happy to share all that. I think um, nobody has the technology to run a CD-ROM these days. That's like trying to get an old ancient video game to run. But uh, I did make a YouTube video where you can sort of see what he was doing and you can, you can get a feel for it. I mean, it, you, you look around at, at, you know, whatever my, my son's playing the, you know, the Nintendo Switch these days, and you're like, man, he was doing that 25 years ago. Um, it's uh, it's mind-bending. Yeah, it was really cool how Prince knew so many of his fans over the years. And at first, I didn't really believe it, but I did later. Um, yeah, I mean, I was talking to Josh Welton the other day, and he was like, oh, yeah, he mentioned you. And I was like, that stopped my heart, you know? And he's like, he knew everybody in the chat. He knew everybody that was if they were noisy enough for long enough, he's like, yeah, I mean, you just see, you know, I was like, well, that's shoot, that's, that was, you know, that's amazing. And, and, you know, the, the thing I said to, to, you know, Joshua was like, you don't, uh, not, not slighting her, but like Madonna is not in the forums being like, I know who that is talking to her fans. Like, you know, like whatever artists you want to point to, they're not, that's not how they engage, but you know, there's a different curiosity and, and a different interest and also just fluency, just knowing the tech. I mean, I talked to artists today that came up purely in the digital world and they don't know it to the depth that, you know, that, that Prince did. Yeah, and because, you know, he was so huge around the world, he never would have been able to have those kinds of relationships in a lot of cases. And I, he probably felt like he could be treated as a normal person too, right? Yeah, the impression I guess I think he felt about being online the same way he felt about being in Minneapolis. Like I can be a person here. I don't have to be that thing. And I think, that, you know, just from people I know that have a public persona, like you, it can be very isolating and very trapped. And to be able to just talk about stuff as opposed to performing all the time, I think it's gotta be, you know, maybe a little bit of a respite. Yeah, and I loved how when we were out at Paisley Park, nobody was chasing him around there. It was just chill. It was like home. Once in a while, people would come in there and start chasing him, and you'd be like, "Get out!" <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first time I went to Paisley was like maybe ninety six, ninety five, and you know, he welcomed us in like like a home. You know, sit down, make yourself comfortable. You know, have a, that was a very very different vibe than you'd expect. You know, where it's this you know grand. You know, it's, he's still him. There's still the, the the persona, but I think that was a really and and it was. That's actually a great example. So there would be performances at Paisley Park in, you know, in the either the main stage or the you know, rehearsal stage. And, and the only way to know about them was to be online. And in 1995, if you were online finding out about there's an event going on, I mean, that was cutting edge. There is no, like I said, that Google didn't launch for many years later. Netflix didn't launch for many years later. And he's just like casually like, I'm gonna put on my website, y'all come by on Friday night. And we did. And, and to know that that would be something that works, I mean, because you think about, you know, in 2015 to do a Paisley Park dance party and say we're going to put it out on social media, of course, of course you would have. 20 years prior, you're right. like, that's, you just, he had always been living in the future and we just all caught up to him. Always. always. Awesome. <laughs> awesome, Anil. Well, can you well, thank you all so much. I appreciate the chance to, to get to talk about this side. Like I said, I, I, the music is always first and last, but I think to think about what, what tech could do and how it can empower you, hopefully. That's that's something that stays with you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Neil. Bye. Bye, Neil. Bye. Wow, that was so that was awesome. Um, just before we transition into our our, our guests, because um, I'm really excited to to hear from them. I just want to recap some of the really important things that Anil mentioned um, as it pertains to us as artists and as songwriters. And um, he said that tech gives us the power to be as creative as we want to be. So we have to use technology, not let technology use us. And we're doing it right now. Look what we were able to accomplish in two days through this, through this, through this technical format. So I think that what he said really re reaffirms what we've been experiencing together the, over these past couple of days. 
He also says that technology gives us ownership. These songs that we created are ours and um, they're gonna grow and I don't know what they're gonna grow into and what they're gonna do and, and how they're gonna affect your lives 10, 20, 30 years from now. I don't know, but I do know we created something special together and that we own it. And it was through the technology that allowed us to do that. So I want you guys to hold on to that. Um, you know, cause we're going through things really quickly, but that's really special. And then lastly, um, he said that um, through that Prince used technology again as an instrument of creative 